I'm a sociologist um, working at the LSE and interested in thinking about the relationship between scientific expertise, other kinds of expertise, forms of capital and forms of inequality. And I just want to explain partly from my own perspective why I think this uh, idea and this issue is of interest to me. I'm not approaching this as an educationalist. Um, I'm really approaching it as someone who's been uh, interested in Pierre Bourdieu's work over a number of years. I'm fascinated with interrogating his idea of cultural capital, you know, which is a, an idea which all of you who are interested in education will be familiar with. The basic idea, as many of you will know, is that um, in modern societies, there's a pervasive form of cultural capital, which Bourdieu describes as the Kantian aesthetic, the ability, to, the ability of certain groups to distance themselves from day-to-day -day, day -day life, to look at things abstractly, to calculate, um, and that capacity to distance yourself from the pragmatic nitty-gritty of life gives you certain abilities and competencies to deal with education, and hence to convert your cultural capital into educational qualifications, get better jobs, become more advantaged. And of course, Bourdieu developed that account in his very famous book, Distinction, published in the early 80s, and it's been subject to extensive research ever since. If you read that book carefully, you'll see that actually he says very little about the issue of science or science knowledge in the book. The fundamental part of his work is really looking at issues around arts and humanities, and he sees, in a way, the aesthetics and the competences around literature, history, music, visual arts, as being fundamental to um, cultural capital as he, as he defines it. And in certain parts of his work, he talks about technical capital, but I think you can say, actually, he doesn't really fully explore what, how he would conceptualise science capital in his thinking. And I think, um, as someone interested in social change in Britain over the last few decades, um, I'm fascinated by Bourdieu's account. I think it has a lot of resonance. I support a lot of what he argues about the power of cultural capital, but I've always also been very interested about the significance of scientific cultures. And this is a theme I pursue in the book, which I read a few years ago, called Identities and Social Change in Britain since 1940, when I used a lot of historical sources over the last 70 years to explore cultural idioms, cultural change. And one of the big changes I, I detected, or I argued we could find, was a move away from a kind of uh, highbrow culture based in the arts and humanities towards one which is more scientifically oriented, more concerned with technique, with expertise. I think you can see that in all sorts of ways. I mean, perhaps one of the ways in which you can see it most obviously is if you look at who the dominant and influential intellectuals are. These days, you can look at people like Stephen Hawking, look at David Attenborough, uh, uh, and so on. They're mostly scientists or people with a strong scientific background. 50 years ago, they're much more likely to have been historians, literary critics, uh, novelists. And I think it's been a shift from a more humanities-oriented intellectual culture to a more scientific one. And you can trace that through, too, in terms of how you know, we can argue that contemporary capitalism has changed from what some economic historians call gentlemanly capitalism, where uh, you know, certain gentlemanly norms prevailed in business and the professions, towards what Nigel Thrift has called knowing capitalism, based upon audit, uh, technical expertise, scientific skill. Uh, and that has arguably eclipsed many of the older forms of gentlemanly culture in many areas of our economy and government. Um, you can link that also to the kind of rise of IT, science, computer skills, and the possible strengthening of a corporate scientific elite. One of the, one of the projects I've been involved with in the recent few years is, with, is working with the BBC on uh, a big project on social class in Britain. We had, a, we had a big BBC web survey to help us. One of our main arguments is we can d detect a very clear emergence of a, a cohesive, significant elite class, very well paid, very well off, very secure, uh, but this is not really the old gentlemanly aristocratic elite. This is really much more of a group of ma senior managers, um, experts, professional scientists who comprise the ranks of that grouping. And I have a slide here coming from this data, which I'll try and explain to you. It's a bit complicated, but in our um, survey, we try and distinguish seven classes. And I don't need to go into details here. The really, I want to talk about two classes, the ones in blue, who are what we call the elite. And this is a group who are very well off, 
and also have high amounts of cultural and social capital. This is the, if you like, the most privileged 8% in the population. Then there's a group who are in red here who we call the established middle classes. These are the secure, affluent professions, but they lack the supreme wealth, if you like, of the, the ones in blue. We can, we, we can ignore the other ones for our purposes here, but what, what we have down here is the type of degree which people did, and we can distinguish, if you do an arts and humanities degree, the proportions going into uh, these various classes. This is a skewed web survey towards the well-educated. Um, so all the figures towards the blue and the red classes are overrepresented, but it's the, it's the relativities between the different degree classes which I think is interesting here. What this shows is if you've got a degree in the arts and humanities, your chances of being in the elite class are actually lower than most of the other degrees you can do. Your chances of being in the elite class are highest if you do a degree in medicine, um, engineering, uh, to some extent business, and to a lesser extent science. If you, if you expand it to, the, to include the established middle class, you find similar patterns prevailing. Um, very high proportions of medicine, not surprising, given the nature of the medical profession, but also engineering and, and the business field. And I think this testifies to a quite significant shift in the British class structure. It suggests that the, if you think about science capital purely instrumentally in terms of uh, providing rewards, then um, arts and humanities, which Bourdieu talks about, is not what you want to be doing. I mean, uh, possibly at Oxford you'd be okay, uh, but you, I'm sure you'll be okay at Oxford, but many universities, that's not what you want to be doing. You want to be doing something else. And that's not what you would expect if you read the pages of distinction. But I also think one can argue that Bourdieu's own model of... Um, cultural capital is dependent upon a particular notion of culture and the arts, which has arguably become rather dated. You know, he celebrates, when well, he doesn't celebrate, he criticises um, the power of artists to stand back from life, you know, to, to embrace the Kantian aesthetic. And that distancing from life is exemplified by the modern museum and art gallery, you know, where you take art out of context of daily life, and you put it in very special galleries. It celebrates the virtues of abstraction, non-representative art, non-representational art. And that, those values, of course, are all very strongly embedded in modernist art and culture, which arguably Bourdieu takes as his model for cultural capital generally. But as we all know, I mean, that model of modernist avant-garde culture is quite dated. And there's all sorts of arguments, including by art historians, such as Thomas Nagel, that that no longer really applies. And one of Nagel's recent book, which I've just been reading, Modern Art, Medieval Art, makes a very interesting art claim that actually modern art is kind of rediscovering medieval practices. If you take medieval art, um, it's, you don't have specialist artists distinct from craftsmen and technicians. They're all bound up together. Um, artisanal work fuses over with uh, creative work. Um, and Nagel argues you're finding much the same motif in contemporary art. If you think about landscape art, installation art, the way in which design operates these days, the gap between you know, the pure artist and the world of engineering, technique, skill, if you like, is much less. So in, if that's true, we might even want to pursue this issue even further and say, well, perhaps Bourdieu's own notion of cultural capital, depending upon a, upon a particular idea of, of the Catholic aesthetic, is really no, no, no longer fit for purpose, even with his own focus upon the arts and humanities. So these are the kind of questions. I mean, this, these are my reworking of what is on this programme, just to kind of, you know, uh, where I think that today's discussion will focus on. So we obviously got the interest in the relationship between scientific forms of competence and skill and expertise, and that between the arts and humanities. And of course, the debates on this go back a long way in the British context. Famously, C.P. Snow, a long time ago, 50 years ago, talking about the two cultures. Well, can we still talk about two cultures, um, if, we if we ever could? Um, what's the relationship between these worlds? Is there a distinctive form of science capital? Or can we see it as a kind of subtype of a broader form of cultural capital? Um, has scientific capital eclipsed cultural capital in Bourdieu's terms, which is more focused upon the arts and humanities? I think one is issue is the whole issue of gender. I mean, scientific cultures have, have, have generally been male cultures. Um, interestingly, the arts and humanities has, in many respects, if you think about novelists particularly, been more open to women. What's the issue about gender relationships between different kinds of scientific and uh, cultural capital? And there's a bigger point, which I know Seamus will speak to. It's kind of, what do we mean by cultural capital at all? And 
some people don't like the idea that the notion of capital gestures towards a kind of inst instrumental use of instrumental way of thinking. People are doing things for certain advantages. And you can see that thinking in some respects in Bourdieu's own work, but is that a bit limiting, really, with respect to how we are understanding the significance of scientific cultures and cultures of expertise, skill, and technique more generally? So I think my point would be that in embracing and thinking about science culture, we're asking other questions too about the whole nature of expertise and competence and skill, uh, and not just about education, but also straddling kind of how we think about contemporary society, the relationship between economy, culture, and politics. So it's a very, I think, very all-embracing discussion as well as quite a focused one.